As mentioned, we are in the Christmas season, so I felt that it is appropriate to preach on messages that pertain to the Christmas message, uh, more like the birth of Jesus Christ, and to really consider the significance of his first coming. Your teacher in school may have told you that there is no such thing as a dumb question. And then, as I thought about that phrase, I decided to Google this question. Who invented the phrase, there is no such thing as a dumb question? Google result gave me Carl Sagan, uh, who was an astronomer in the 20th, 20th century. And the point of this phrase is to uh, encourage you not to be afraid to ask questions and to be on the quest of understanding the world around you. And it's better to ask questions than to pretend that you already know the answers. During this Christmas season at OBC, uh, it is an opportunity for us to reflect on this question, why was Jesus born? Why was Jesus born? And how would you answer this question? You see, this question aims to answer the purpose of his birth. It is a simple question, and the answer can be so simple that a young child can understand it. And the answer can be so profound that it sinks theologians into the ocean of spiritual water. And so for me, I aim to strike the answer at the middle of the spectrum. See, this message is not just merely intellectual, but that it is personal and it is actually very practical. Perhaps this will be a refresher for some of you. Uh, perhaps this would be a reminder of what Christmas is all about because, let's face it, it is so easy for this season to just come and go and just take this holiday season for granted. And perhaps God will use this message to bring about salvation to you if you're not in Christ. And so today, uh, it's not going to be our typical exposition of God's word. It's more of a topical uh, message. I'm going to be drawing a lot of passages from the Bible, particularly the Gospel of John. And so I decided to answer this question by focusing on the writings of the Apostle John, the Gospel of John and also 1 John. And so some of you may be aware that John doesn't explicitly and directly talk about the Christmas story that we're so used to. You have Joseph and Mary traveling to Bethlehem, and then you have the Magi and the wise men going to Bethlehem, and the, stores, and the star pointed them to Jesus Christ. You have the story of where the angels spoke to the shepherds, and then you have, of course, the nativity scene where Jesus Christ was born, and he was lying in a manger. Indeed, those stories aren't in the Gospel of John. Matthew and Luke are more explicit about the birth of Jesus. So why did I choose John to, to talk about and answer this question? See, the reason why I chose John is because he describes Jesus as the sent one, the sent one. And so throughout the Gospel of John, the author constantly tells us and reminds us of the Christmas story. When we consider the birth of Jesus on Christmas, we should remember that he wasn't just merely born 2,000 years ago, but he was sent. He came into the world as the sent one. Almost about 20 times in the Gospel of John and three times in 1 John, John refers to Jesus as being sent. And the word sent, or to send, is de in the Greek is defined as causing someone to depart for a particular purpose. And the Greek word is pronounced as apostello, apostello. And if you listen to this word carefully, then you should remember that this word sounds very close to the word apostles. And that's because they are within the same root family. See, the word apostles, as we've been learning in the, in the book of Acts, means one who is sent on mission. One who is sent on mission. And so Jesus Christ, he was sent here on earth on a seek and save mission. 
Furthermore, John constantly tells us that he was sent by the Father. The Father is the sender, and Jesus, the Son, he's the sent one. And John speaks about the Trinitarian relationship between the Father and the Son, but that will be another sermon for another year if you're interested in learning about the relationship between the, within the Godhead. John wrote his gospel to tell us that Jesus is, the, is God incarnate. He's the second person of the Trinity. He's the one who took upon himself human nature and became a man. And not just any ordinary man, but the God-man, perfect in Godhead and also perfect in manhood, being truly God and truly man. As we have just read, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as the only one from the Father, full of grace and truth. And so knowing that the Father sent Jesus into the world, we can also reflect on this question. Why did the Father send his Son into the world? Although worded and phrased differently, it can still accomplish the goal of answering this question. Why was Jesus born? Why did Jesus, Jesus, Jesus come into the world? Why was he sent by the Father? So that's what we're going to tackle this morning. And then following two weeks, I'm going to be asking ourselves two more questions. Why was Jesus born in Bethlehem? And why was Jesus born of a, of a virgin? But for today, just generally speaking, we're going to tackle this question. Why was Jesus born? And based on John's writing, there are perhaps at least six reasons why Jesus was born. At least six reasons, because I'm certain that there are more that we can talk about, but we will only consider six reasons this morning. And so why was Jesus born? Why was Jesus born? First, he was born to be the savior of the world. John 3, 16 to 7, John chapter 3, verses 16 to 17 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And 1 John chapter 4, verse 14, And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Very simple, to be the savior of the world. God sent his son into the world to save sinners. He came to seek and to save the lost. And for Jesus to be the savior of the world implies that we need to be saved from a danger that will fall upon sinners, which is eternal condemnation. And it also implies that we are not our own savior. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot earn our way to heaven. We cannot attain perfect righteousness. We cannot be reconciled to our Heavenly Father by ourselves. Not by merit, not by being religious only on Easter and Christmas, not by giving nice Christmas presents to someone, not by helping the poor, and not by just doing merits. None of those things, none of those things because we are not our own savior. We cannot save ourselves. That title belongs to Christ alone. Jesus is the Savior because that's precisely what his name means. Jesus. Because his name, Jesus, is derived from Hebrew and Aramaic, which is called Yeshua. Yeshua, and it means Yahweh, or the Lord, saves or Yahweh is salvation. If, if you don't know, Yahweh is God's personal name who reveals himself to Moses at the burning bush. I am who I am. Furthermore, Yeshua is the same spelling for Joshua in Hebrew. And when translating from Hebrew to Greek, Joshua becomes yet Jesus. And so in English, Jesus in the Greek is spelled as Jesus. Joshua and Jesus mean Yahweh is salvation. The Lord is salvation. Jesus is the all-sufficient Savior. He came to save, he came to rescue and to deliver. 
He is the grace of God who appeared, bringing salvation for all people. Peter preached to the Jewish leaders back in Acts chapter 4, verse 12, that there is, no, there is salvation in no one else, but there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. So in other words, salvation is in the name of Jesus alone. Jesus is the only Savior of the world. No one else was born of the virgin. No one else lived a sinless life. No one else died bearing our sins. No one else was raised from the dead to conquer Satan's sin and death. No one else is seated at the right hand of God. Jesus is the only Savior and no one else. And, and for you personally, in order for you to understand the role of Jesus as Savior, in order for you to receive him and believe unto him for salvation, you must understand your own fallen and desperate condition. See, some think that Jesus came to save them and rescue them from bad marriage or from depression, from bad grades in school, from poverty and bankruptcy. And I hate to break it to you, but those are not what Jesus came to save you from. Those may be the byproduct, byproduct of what, tru of what Jesus truly came to save them from. See, what Jesus came to save you from is from your sins, from yourself, from eternal condemnation. That's what Jesus came to do. He came into the world to save sinners and to transform them into a new creation. So why was Jesus born? He was born to be the savior of the world. That's the first reason. Second reason of why Jesus was born is that he came to be the propitiation for our sins. The propitiation for our sins. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10 says, In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now, in your other Bible translations, it may say atoning sacrifice, but propitiation is more accurate. Translation is a biblical and theological term, so it's, good, it's a good word to have in your Bible, you can perhaps write that word down on your Bible. But what is propitiation? See, in order to understand propitiation, you must also understand your relationship with God before you became a Christian. You see, if you're not in Christ, then you are in enmity with God because of your sins. John 3, verse 36 says that whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. You see, what sin does is that it arouses the wrath and displeasure of God. It provokes him to anger for a righteous reason, not for arbitrary reasons. You see, since God is holy and the righteous judge, he must judge and punish sin and unrighteousness. Before he became a born-again Christian, Martin Luther Martin Luther, the Protestant reformer, was terrified and fearful of the wrath of God. And this is a disposition that is so far removed from modern churches and Christians. See, someone asked, once asked Luther, Brother Martin, do you love God? You know what Luther said? Luther said, love God? You ask me if I love God? Sometimes I hate God. That's the language he used. I see Christ as a consuming judge who is simply looking at me to evaluate me and to visit affliction upon me. And so what later on, Luther tried to understand how a sinner can be reconciled to a holy God. He was troubled by the fact that, he has such, that God has such a high standard the peasants had to perform uh, various rituals and pay indulgences in hopes, just in hopes to be right with God. You know, Luther was a very studious student. He, was, he knew many languages. He knew Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, and of course German. He especially liked reading the Old Testament in the Greek language, which was known as the Septuagint. 
And as Luther was studying the Bible, and specifically Romans chapter 3, he, dis he discovered the word propitiation. Propitiation. And he was quite familiar with that word because it reminded him of Exodus chapter 25. Now in, in Exodus chapter 25, it gives us a description of the tabernacle. tabernacle. As Israel was traveling to the promised land, the, tab the tabernacle would be at the center of their encampment where the presence of God dwelt in the midst of his people. And if you know anything about the structure of the tabernacle and the elements inside it, or the artifacts inside it, then you should remember that at the, at the center of the tabernacle, there's a room called the Holy of Holies. And at the center of the Holy of Holies lies an artifact known as the Ark of the Covenant. And sitting on top of the Ark of the Covenant was the mercy seat. And this is the place where the high priest can enter once a year on the Day of Atonement. And the high priest would take the blood of the animal sacrifices and sprinkle over and in front of the mercy seat, thus taking away and removing the sins of Israel for that year. And the word to describe the mercy seat is precisely the same Greek word for propitiation. Propitiation answers the issue of removing the wrath of God that a sinner deserves by removing sin. The animal sacrifices that were able to temporarily atone for sin ultimately foreshadowed and pointed to the perfect sacrifice of the perfect God-man, Jesus Christ. So what Christ did on the cross was to satisfy and appease God's wrath by becoming our substitute, paying the penalty of our sins, and canceling the debts of those who trust in him. That's why Christ came. He came into the world to be the propitiation for our sins, to take away our sin and the wrath to come and to be the mercy seat. That's why Jesus was born. The third reason of why Jesus was born is to give eternal life to those who believe in him. Again, John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. 1 John chapter 4, verse 9, in this, is love, in this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world, so that we might live through him. Eternal, eternal life is probably... John's favorite phrase. He mentions it a lot in his writings. See, Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 10, that the thief comes only to kill, steal, and destroy, but I come, I came, so that they may have life and have it abundantly. See, prior, prior to knowing Jesus Christ, we did not have eternal life. We were by nature objects of God's wrath, we have fallen short of the glory of God and we have sinned against him and for the wages of sin is death and because of our sin we deserve death by virtue of the fact that we are sinners. Although we may have life in a biological sense, but outside of Christ, we're spiritually dead in our trespasses as Paul says in Ephesians 2. That's why Jesus came to make us spiritually alive and to give us eternal life. Eternal life is a gift from God. It cannot be earned. It cannot be merited. Paul says in Romans 6, 23, that eternal life is a gift of God found in Christ Jesus. And, God, and John compliments Paul's teaching when he says, it, says this in 1 John chapter 5, verses 11 to 12. And this is a testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. Eternal life is reserved for only for those who have repented of their sins 
and trusted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. So let me ask you a question. Do you have eternal life? If not, then the bad news is that not only will you experience the first death like everyone else, but you will experience the second death, which is eternal hell. However, the good news during this Christmas season, good news is that Jesus came into the world. And especially right now, during this season, especially when gifts come into people's thoughts and minds, the greatest gift, the free gift freely offered to you, a gift that you cannot pay, you cannot purchase with money, the greatest gift that you can ever receive is Jesus Christ because eternal life is in him. That's why Jesus was born. He came to give eternal life to those who believe unto him for salvation. Fourth reason of why Jesus was born, he came to accomplish the will of the Father. He came to accomplish the will of the Father. John 4, 34 says, Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. John 5, 36, but the testimony that I have, that I have is greater than that of John for the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. John 6, 38, for I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. On the night before he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus, along with his disciples, he was at the place called the Garden of Gethsemane. And at that location, we recall in the gospel that Jesus spent some time praying before he was arrested and tried before the Jewish council. And knowing the horror of what he would endure on the cross, Jesus prayed to his father, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And Jesus, he humbly and obediently and voluntarily chose to do the will of the Father while he was on earth. While we failed, we as human beings, while we failed to do the will of God, Jesus obeyed and accomplished his will perfectly. Paul says in Philippians 2.8 that Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That's what Jesus came to do. And Jesus also said, and said this in John chapter 5, verse 19, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. This does not deny the fundamental truth that the Father and the Son are equal within the Trinity. In fact, this statement, does, it, it does imply his equality with the Father, since Jesus alone can do what the Father does. Yet at the same time, the Father and Son have different functions and roles after Christ became a man. And the role of the Son was to submit himself to the Father. And if Jesus did not accomplish the will of the Father, or even if Jesus just partially did the will of the Father, then he wouldn't be the perfect Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Because theologically, there would not be a perfect alignment within the Godhead. See, over and over again in the Gospel of John, Jesus makes it clear that everything he did and said were in perfect alignment with God's will. John chapter 12, verses 49 to 50 says, Jesus says this, For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has, given, has himself given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is the eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. So why was Jesus born? He came to do the will of the Father. And that includes going to the cross. 
and dying for our sins and calling everyone, you, to repent of your sins and to believe in the gospel. And by doing the will of the Father, Christ came in, into the world to reveal the Father to us, and that's the fifth reason. Why was Jesus born? To make the Father known. John chapter 17, verses 24 to 26 says, Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, to see my glory that you have given me, because you love me before the foundation of the world. O righteous Father, even though the world does not know you, I know you, and these know that you have sent me. I made known to them your name, and I will continue to make it known, that the love with which you have loved me may be in them, and I in them. See, in this context of the high priestly prayer, Jesus tells us that he and the Father have known each other before the world was created. Both of them had an intimate and eternal relationship with each other. They both had, have perfect love for each other. Therefore, Jesus knew the Father perfectly. Since nobody has ever seen God, Christ, Jesus, who was at the Father's side for all of eternity, came into the world to make the Father known, to explain who he is and what he does. And so the disciples of Jesus, having spent three years with Jesus, came to know the Father by knowing Jesus Christ. So that's why Jesus was born. The Father sent his Son to make himself known and if you ever doubt the existence of God, then I encourage you to look to Jesus. He is God in the flesh. You can come to know Jesus, and by knowing Jesus, you can also have a relationship and communion with the Father. Last reason, reason number six. Why was Jesus born? He came to manifest the love of God. John 3, 16 again, for God so loved the world. 1 John chapter 4, verse 9, in this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world. What is the motivation of God sending into the world? Why is there Christmas? Why is there the birth of Jesus? Why was Jesus born? It's not because of God's love, and we just sang about it, that love came down on Christmas. God's motive in sending Jesus Christ into the world was his love for the world. But how do you, how does one measure this kind of love? There are three indicators of how we can measure this kind of love. Indicator number one, is the identity of the lover. The greater the lover, the greater the love. Indicator number two is the object of that love. The lesser the object, the greater the love. Indicator number three is the expression of that love. The greater the expression, the more marvelous the love. Some have a superficial and shallow understanding of God's love. He loved the world not because there's anything lovely about the world, not because there's anything likable about the world, not because there's anything special and unique about the world. God loves in spite of the filthy, wretched, sin-wrenched world. It is like trying to love your enemy, which is hard most of the time. It is like trying to love and forgive the person who did something egregious and atro atrocious to you and maybe even your family members and does not deserve love, compassion, and mercy, and forgiveness. We have sinned against God. We have broken His law. We have committed, a, as R.C. Sproul once said, a cosmic 
as cosmic treason and utter rebellion against God. We have not loved God. We're sinners. We're sinners. And if you understand this reality, then that should amaze and should even humble you because you need to realize that you are utterly unworthy of being loved by God. And yet, as Paul says in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, that God demonstrated his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This, is, this love is God's agape love. It is his self-sacrificial love. It is his covenant, faithful, and loyal love for his chosen people. He is by nature love, for he is the great lover and the object of God's love for sinners to take our breaths away. We are the lesser object of God's great and marvelous love. But why? Why would God condescend to become human to save wretched sinners like us? Why would God choose to show his love by sending his son into the world? I think it is meant to show us how glorious, how glorious God is. God's love in sending his son is the most glorious expression of his plan of redemption in saving sinners. There is really no way to exhaust the exposition of God's great love. There is no way for any of God's people to fully comprehend the love of God because the love of Christ surpasses all understanding. And in response, perhaps some of you, even having hearing this, some of you may be apathetic, maybe unmoved, maybe all too familiar of the Christmas story, but remain unchanged. If the love of God doesn't even move and change you, then you need to ask yourself, do I truly know and believe the love of God revealed to us in the cross of Christ? Brothers and sisters, listen to the words of the 17th century English Puritan John Owen. He said this, and I quote, The greatest sorrow and burden you can lay on the Father, the greatest unkindness that you could do to him, is not believe that he loves you. End quote. And if you truly know and see the love of God in the most personal way, then you can also hear the comforting and encouraging words from John Owen. But he also said this, and I quote, So much as we see the love of God, so much shall we delight in him and no more. End quote. The purpose of Jesus' birth is multifaceted. He came to be, he came to be the savior of the world, to be the propitiation for, of our sins, to give eternal life to those who believe in him, to accomplish the will of the Father, to make the Father known, and to manifest the love of God. But all these facets are meant to point to the ultimate purpose of Jesus' birth, to suffer and to die on the cross. That's why Jesus came. Jesus was sent with a mission and the ministry on earth to save sinners by dying on the cross for our sins. And this idea is not merely intellectual. It is supposed to be practical and personal. And so as you consider and reflect why Jesus was born, it should be personal to you because Christ came into the world to save sinners like you. And it should be personal as you see and to savor Jesus Christ for all that he has done for you. Think about it. 
Jesus came to the world to save me, when there's nothing lovable, where there's nothing savable about me, there's nothing in me that is, deserves saving and love, it should humble you to worship God more deeply and to see his glory even more. And so let's consider the first application I would suggest for you to consider in response to this message. You can love him. You can, you can love God and delight in God because he first loved you. That's why Christ came. And if you love Jesus, then in response, you will keep his commandments. That is the proof of your response to his love. But whoever does not love Christ does not keep his words. The evidence that you love Jesus is that you keep his commandments. And if you don't love Christ, then you don't love his word. And if you don't love his word and keep his word, then you don't truly love Christ. And you may be found unfaithful in the last days. And you may be found to hear these words of Jesus, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. That should be our response. We love because he first loved us. In the second application, can be found in John chapter 20, verse 21, where Jesus says, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Christmas is God's seek and save mission. God the Father was the sender, Jesus was the sent one, and now in this context of John chapter 20, verse 21, having accomplished all that the Father wants Christ to do, Jesus now becomes the sender by commissioning his disciples to be his witnesses, to be his messengers and representatives of the Great Commission. And this has been the topic of discussion that we, as we've been going through the book of Acts. And so in response, we are the sent ones now. We have the responsibility to be ambassadors for Christ who have been entrusted to us with the message of reconciliation. And so during this Christmas, it is a good opportunity to talk to someone about the birth of Jesus Christ and the gospel message. And not only that, it's also a good opportunity to invite people to church and to hear the gospel message. And so, I hope that you now have a good idea of why Jesus was born. And this question is not a dumb question. It's not a dumb question to ask. But I also hope that the answers that were given were not dumb as well. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you. We're thankful for the fact that you love us. We thank you for the fact that you sent your son into the world to die on the cross for our sins. Lord, during this Christmas, help us to reflect more deeply of why Christ came. And help us, Lord, where we have fallen short. Help us, God, to respond to you appropriately and learning to apply this message into our lives. It could be a practical thing. It could be a personal thing. It could be something that we can be in awe of as we think about the love of God more deeply. And Lord, as we get an opportunity to reflect on the birth of Jesus, we get to also celebrate the Lord's Supper. So we thank you that we get to remember of what Christ has done, came to come to them, of why Christ came to the world to die, came to the world for. So Father, please help us to uh, reflect upon this truth. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.